from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Today. Farmers speak out on trade. Farmers and ranchers are among the most patriotic people in the world, but going bankrupt should not be a consequence of that dedication. As Congress hears from producers impacted by tariffs, the Farm Bill heads for conference committee. In agribusiness, falling grain prices are an opportunity for end users. Take advantage of the bargain. There's a risk in doing nothing. We're cheap enough in price that we can no longer sit and wait to do nothing. The rising beef over lab-grown meat. And as July temperatures rise, growers in California focus on worker safety. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado, High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Five farmers testifying before a House subcommittee Wednesday telling lawmakers how retaliatory tariffs by China and other trading partner nations are affecting the rural economy. The farmers spoke not only on behalf of their own interest, but they also represented Farm Bureau state chapters. China slapping tariffs on a range of U.S. farm products, including soybeans, earlier this month those tariffs have made the U.S. products more expensive, pushing buyers to find other sources like Brazil. Since the end of May, new crop soybean futures have dropped about $2 a bushel, or 20 percent, and corn has dropped about 65 cents a bushel. The markets react daily to the trade wars and tariff news, and if sales have to be made at these price levels, this whole issue will show up as a massive shortfall in expected income on our financial statements. Specifically for our small farm in South Dakota, uh, this amounts to a negative impact of about $150,000 for corn and beans alone. Farmers and ranchers are among the most patriotic people in the world, but going bankrupt should not be a consequence of that dedication. As a result of this dramatic cost increase and volatility in the market, we abandoned our grain storage expansion project. The implications of that not only harmed my operation, it also hurt my community. A small local construction company lost a project, a U.S. grain bin company missed a sale, and a domestic steel company had one less shipment to send out of their factory. So let me be clear on this. For just three crops in one year, China legally, illegally exceeded its WTO limits by $100 billion. Put this in, putting this into context, we just finished a hard-fought farm bill debate where some, some people questioned the need for support provided to our farmers. But China's illegal subsidies for those three crops in one year exceeded what we will spend on the entire farm safety net for every crop on every acre for the entire life of the Farm Bill. On the Senate side, lawmakers talking about legislative steps that would block or at least curtail the administration's tariffs. According to Farm Journal Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch is backing possible action that blocks the administration's tariffs on imports from some key trading partners. Members of the president's party are opposed to U.S. tariffs on imported steel and aluminum and the resulting economic impact of retaliatory tariffs. We have to help U.S. businesses and innovators, farmers and ranchers, compete globally, and that means we have to confront the challenges posed by China. That is why I have recommended to the president that it is time to engage in negotiations with China using a targeted strategy to address their unfair trade practices. And while those efforts are underway, the administration should not impose further tariffs on our allies and partners. Also on trade, other trade missions are underway as U.S. officials visit their counterparts in Southeast Asia. Under Secretary for Ag for Trade and Foreign Ag Affairs, Ted McKinney, leading a trip to Indonesia, including a delegation of buyers from Malaysia and the Philippines interested in purchasing U.S. farm and food products. Now, McKinney says the countries insist they will purchase and stay with U.S. soy. They are absolutely driven to stay with U.S. soy. They've enjoyed the quality, the consistency, and I mean, they're very pointed on it. They, they do not and they will not change. McKinney saying questions came up about trade tariffs, but there was, quote, no negativity. The House voting Wednesday to go to conference with the Senate on the 2018 Farm Bill. And that vote moved to earlier in this week, so House Ag Ranking Member Colin Peterson could return to Minnesota for his father's visitation and funeral. 
On the Senate side, Chairman Roberts saying his chamber will have seven conference members, four Republicans, three Democrats. The House expected to have 20 conferees and some additional representatives from other panels with jurisdiction on appropriate issues. Now, I was Chuck Grassley saying there's a good chance of finalizing a conference report before Labor Day. One stumbling block that has to be settled uh, fairly uh, simply by not going along with the House's provisions to require uh, work, work requirements for food stamp recipients. Now, it, it happens that I would support that effort as long as it doesn't include the elderly, the disabled, and families with children, but uh, we'll never get 60 votes in the United States Senate for that. A major change in the biofuels industry is one of the most vocal supporters changes jobs. Renewable Fuels Association President and CEO Bob Deneen will transition into the role of Senior Strategic Advisor. Deneen's been with RFA for 30 years, and during that time, he saw the passage of the Renewable Fuel Standard. Current Executive Vice President Jeff Cooper will assume the position of CEO and President of RFA. Let's take a quick tour of farm country. Mike Hoffman of the Ag Day Weather Team joining us for today's Crop Comments. Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Take a look at these two pictures. The first is an aerial view of farms in Illinois. The second, a similar shot from the skies above Colorado. These come from Tyne Morgan. She says a Colorado farmer told her wheat yields in Colorado this year are half of the average and corn looks decent, but there are large pockets that were hailed out that won't make it to harvest. NAS says 70% of the state's corn is rated good to excellent, while 80% of winter wheat now harvested. Typically, it's only about 60% cut. And taking a look at the wind speed forecast, uh, kind of windy around a storm system in the north central plains, a little breezy in parts of Texas this morning. Heading through the afternoon, the winds continue in the northern Mississippi Valley, back into uh, South Dakota, a few spots out west as well. Tomorrow then, uh, we'll continue to see that slow moving storm system moving farther east into parts of the Great Lakes. And it turns a little windy in some of those uh, heavier thunderstorms, parts of the southern plains into the southeast by afternoon hours. We'll talk more about your forecast coming up, but first, here are some hometown temps. Plan for the unexpected with weather forecast updates. Local forecasts are delivered right to your cell phone each morning, making planning a little bit easier. Just text weather 6 to 31313 to get started. When we come back, we'll look at grain markets from an end user perspective. And taking a job as a field worker in California can be dangerous during the summer. We'll see how farmers and university experts are helping to keep workers safe and hydrated. In agribusiness, a mixed day for Markets Tuesday. We get details now from our friends of the floor and CME. Soybeans were mixed. It really was up and down. Right out of the box, we had about a 10 cent range and the market kind of bouncing back and forth from unchanged. Uh, prices are really cheap right now and commercials are net long. Uh, trying to underpin this market and try to push it a little bit higher. Corn was steady. Uh, overall, the trend is still down as well in corn. And now we're finding that some bargain hunters are starting to tick, uh, put their toe in the water and start to gobble up a little bit of these uh, straggling futures here at these low prices. That's all from the floor at the CME Group. Here in Chicago, I'm Virginia McGathy. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, we have Brian Doherty, Stuart Peterson. Brian, let's talk about, not from the farmer perspective, we know how folks are feeling right now from a from a grain perspective. Let's talk about it from an end user, sure. our, our livestock folks perspective. For them, there's some opportunity here longer term. Yeah, it's 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 really disappointing for the grain producer. It looked like we had some real potential to maybe, you know, go somewhere this summer with prices and that hasn't been the case. We tipped over again this year. Frustrating because it happened last year and the sure. year before. But for the livestock guy, yeah. uh, or anybody who purchases, what a wonderful opportunity to buy something. You know, I'll put this in the terms that may not sit too well with some of the producers, but you know, if you're a corn farmer, you work real hard, you produce a crop, you take all the risk, and I come along and say, hey, I'll take it off your hands. Thanks for taking the risk. Oh, by the way, I'll pay you less than what it costs you to produce it. Right. That doesn't sit well with you, but it sits well with me. That's a bargain. Right. So right. take advantage of the bargain. There's a risk in doing nothing. We're cheap enough in price that we can no longer sit and wait to do nothing. Start locking in long-term needs. I'm talking 25, 50% through the end of 2019. Oh, so long-term. You're thinking right. long-term. Long-term. Because, because these are pre, uh, uh, pretty They're low. low prices. They're yeah. low prices. Um, you know, a lot can change. Yeah. And if this tariff stuff gets resolved, sure. if there's weather issues or problems, 
Um, expect that prices are going to move higher and they could be violently higher if there's still weather or tariffs or both of these yeah. things come together well, to yeah, kind of solve themselves. Right, and we're talking about El Nino this winter which could impact Brazil's crop down in South America. Uh, you know, there's potential out there. There's, there's a potential. lot of potential. And so for the livestock folks, this may be a real opportunity. The goal that I, I would tell livestock producers is assume that producers, you're a great farmer, you're going to produce a, an average to above average crop until proven otherwise. So right now you're proving that you're producing that crop, prices reflect at that, take advantage of that while you can. Yeah, sure. There's a cyclical nature to commodities. Things come along and prices change and then there's a lot of regret if you don't take action, so don't have the regret. All right, appreciate it. Thank you so much for the advice. We'll be back with more agri in just a minute. To discuss marketing strategies, call 800-334-9779 or visit stuartpeterson.com. Welcome back to Ag Day here Meteorologist Mike Hoffman. And Mike, uh, I saw some posts on Twitter and social media. Uh, looks like some rain fell Wednesday in parts of Missouri. Is this going to bring any more? Do we and there's think? probably more. This is a very slow moving storm system. Now, once that warm front gets past, their uh, chances diminish a little bit. Uh, so we'll be putting our maps into motion here. But we also have that storm system along the Gulf. It's not going to be a tropical storm or anything, but it will have a lot of tropical moisture with it. And of course, uh, a lot of this moisture up here, one thing you have to think about this time of year is we get a lot of moisture coming up through the southwestern parts of the country. And that feeds into these thunderstorms, especially ahead of a warm front. Uh, across the northern uh, and central plains and those will be moving east. So let's put these maps into motion. You can see widespread showers and thunderstorms. Northern Mississippi Valley uh, back into parts of the eastern Dakotas all the way down into uh, Illinois and Missouri and Iowa as we head through the afternoon hours. Widespread showers and thunderstorms closer to this area of low pressure. Our model not showing a whole lot in the southwest. It's kind of uh, lessened a little bit those afternoon spotty thunderstorms, but they'll be picking up again over the next few weeks. They always do. Taking a look at that tomorrow morning storm system kind of coming together, those two areas of low pressure. Uh, again, this is a slow mover. It's almost a cutoff as we head into the weekend. I'll show you that on the, on the jet stream. But you can see uh, close to Chicago by the time we get to uh, later tomorrow. And out ahead of that is where you get these complexes of storms, mainly ahead of that warm front or along the warm front, with uh, widespread heavy rains in some of those. And that's what we're hoping for in some of these areas that have been getting drier and drier. You can see scattered showers back behind this system and also through the southeast as well as the southwest. All right, there's the precipitation estimates over the past 24 hours. Now, these are from radar estimates, so sometimes they're, uh, they, they can be a little bit less than what actually fell. But you can see from South Dakota all the way to the Gulf Coast, there's been some areas of showers and thunderstorms with uh, one to two inch amounts in some areas, adding in the next 36 hours. All depends on where these uh, thunderstorms develop, so don't be concerned about these pockets of dry air. You just kind of hope you're not in one of those. but. A computer model is not going to get all those correct exactly where thunderstorms are going to occur. But look at all this moisture. Northern Florida, southern Georgia, into the coastal areas of, of uh, South Carolina. Those areas have been getting dry as well, so that's some good news. Boy, is it going to be hot again today. Most of Oklahoma and Texas highs triple digits. A little bit more pleasant. Northern plains across the Great Lakes into the northeast. Lows tonight, lots of 60s across the uh, northern tier of states. 80s for low temperatures, parts of Texas, triple digits again in those areas as we head through the day tomorrow. Here's the jet stream. Here's that storm system coming across the area. Now look as we head into the weekend. Just kind of cuts off in the Ohio Valley, Southern Great Lakes. That will continue the chances for uh, showers and storms. And then a trough really digs in by later next week. That'll be some pretty cool air for this time of the year. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Billings, Montana. First of all, mostly sunny, rather hot. High of 91 degrees, very hot in Springdale, Arkansas. Sunny as well, high up to 98. And finally, Toledo, Ohio, partly sunny, comfortably warm, high around 82 degrees. The growing debate over meat and milk labels will take a taste with Drover's editor Greg Henderson after the break. And later, while we enjoy fresh picked produce, summer field hands are enduring that July heat. We'll see how UC Davis is helping keep workers safe today in the country. In this new age of food, there's growing debate on what to call a product that looks like meat but doesn't come from a steer. Likewise, what do you call a consumable liquid that looks like milk but doesn't come from a cow? 
From our partners at Drovers, an overwhelming number of consumers say they want food products developed from cultured animal cells to be clearly labeled as such. There's no shortage of names, lab meat, cultured meat, clean meat, regardless of what you call it, consumers want it labeled. 49% of respondents said lab-grown animal products should be labeled as meat but accompanied by an explanation about how it's produced, while another 40% said it should be labeled as something other than meat. Only 5% thought it should be labeled as meat without any further explanation. Henderson says when given a list of seven terms and asked to choose which would constitute accurate labels, the most commonly chosen terms were lab-grown meat at 35%, now artificial or synthetic meat with 34%, and the least commonly chosen terms were cultured meat, clean meat, and in vitro meat. Last week, the FDA held a meeting to get input from the industry on the safety of the technology, as well as considerations for how possibly to label the product so consumers know they're getting meat from a lab. There's also been some debate over which agency, FDA or USDA, should regulate lab-grown meat. Likewise, in dairy, soy and almond drinks that bill themselves as milk may need to consider alternative language. FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb suggesting this week his agency may start cracking down on use of the term. The FDA chief says his agency has not aggressively gone after the proliferation of plant-based drinks labeled as milk. Gottlieb says there are hundreds of federal standards of identity spelling out how foods with various names need to be manufactured, but the standards are not enforced. But the change won't happen overnight. The agency must go through the rule writing process, including allowing time for public comment. Picking produce can be a brutally hot job in July. Up next, we'll see how folks in California are teaming up to help keep workers safe. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Learn more about Kubota SSV Series skid steers at Kubota.com or demo one at your local Kubota dealer today. July is one of, if not the, hottest month of the year. It's also a key month for some produce harvest in California, but getting those crops to your grocery store comes with risks for the workers dealing with the heat. In this report provided by UC Davis, the university shows us how it and area growers are working to educate and protect those hired hands. People pass away from this heat, you know? That's what they need to understand, that this heat ain't no joke. They need to keep their body maintenance with water. If you have no water, you already know how it feels, you know? So with all these, you know, fruits and vegetables that we grow here, which is great, and there is a lot of demand for those, I can grow all the crops on my farm with 15 or 20 people, but then I need several hundred people to pick the crops. So we have a lot, of, a lot of seasonal needs for people that just come in in the summer to work the crops. Heat stress is a very dangerous thing, especially for people who are starting to work the first day of July and it's hot, and if they haven't been working in the field, it, it can be quite dangerous. It's been years since there's been a fatality among an agricultural worker from pesticides. On the other hand, heat exposure has become more significant as a hazard for agricultural workers uh, for a variety of factors. One is climate change. The temperature is getting warmer and when you're working outdoors, you are vulnerable. You are excessively exposed to that and at risk, particularly doing heavy labor. But there are other reasons. Work organization has changed, mechanization, pace of work. All of those are factors that have changed over the last few decades and made heat a more significant health problem, uh, in fact, than agrochemicals. Y si llegan a enfermarse mucho, 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 que les están, que se, estos ya se descomponen y ya no filtren. It's very important because the weather is changing and the temperatures are going to be like more extremes. We really need to be more aware of how that is affecting us. It's important to get, uh, get the people trained early, get them on board with the program so that they're, 
They're drinking plenty of water. They're taking their rest breaks uh, when they're supposed to. I think it shows in, in, in the results of what we've been doing. There used to be frequent deaths in the fields from heat exhaustion or heat stress. In the last five or six years, there have been very few. I think that's, that's a result of growers taking on programs to try to prevent that from happening. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us. For Mike Hoffman and all of us here at AgDam, Clinton Griffiths, have a great day.